Great. And welcome everyone to our webinar this morning, Law Enforcement and the Special Needs Community. Today we have Officer B. Hutchinson. Everyone calls him Hutch. He is presenting from the Provo Police Department. Officer Hutchinson grew up in Wyoming where he joined the Army Reserve and graduated from Casper College with an associate in criminal justice. He moved to Utah in the winter of 2017 and has been at the Provo Police Department for over four years. He specializes in teaching law enforcement about autism and currently serves as a community resource officer. Thank you all for being here today and let's welcome Officer Hutchinson. Thanks for having me. So give me one second. I'm gonna jump back over to my PowerPoint and we'll get started. All right, can everyone see that okay? Yes. Perfect. All right, so this, this presentation is just gonna be kind of a brief overview of how we interact as law enforcement with the special needs community, what kind of calls we went, go to, what kind of training we have, and things that we find that the community can do to help us when they're asking us for help. So we kind of went over a, a little bit, but I'm Officer Hutchinson. I've been with the Provo Police Department for four years. I started in August, 2019. And I'm also one of three autism instructors for uh, the Provo Police Department. Officer Carter and Officer Wood are also autism instructors. And what that means is that we actually give annual training to our officers here in Provo about autism specifically. And how we got tasked with that is that all three of us have family members and ties to the autism community. So that's how I kind of got involved in the special needs community as far as the police from police perspective goes. So I just kind of want to start by talking about what kind of training law enforcement gets about special needs. Um, so we have mandatory trainings that come down from the state. Our training is <clears throat> mandated by what's called POST, which is our peace officer standard and training. And they decide what kind of trainings we get, what trainings are allowed towards our training and how much training we have to get to keep our certification. So every year we have to have at least 40 hours of reoccurring training in order to keep our certification. And some of that training is manda mandated to be in mental health, um, whether that be autism, crisis intervention, and de-escalation are three that we have to get at least one hour in each year. Um, and types of trainings that we do that through is PowerPoints, kind of like the one that we have here. We also go over videos such as body cam videos, events, um, training videos that teach us about special needs and things like that, as well as we'll review body cam footage of things that are either good or bad and take learning from that. And then we'll also do what's called scenario-based training, where we'll have either actors or other officers that will kind of set up a scenario where you pretend like you're going to this call and kind of play through the scenario and get to have sort of a practice run first calls like that and see how you'd react. And then we can discuss things such as like legalities of what we're allowed to do and whatnot. So we do a lot of training and try and focus in on that. that when we do get calls to people's homes or the community, we, we have a good understanding of what we can and can't do and what ways we can help and what resources we have that way. Um, we also have what's called crisis intervention uh, team. And it, the training is a certification in of itself and it's 40 hours of initial training. So you spend a whole week going over just crisis intervention things involving mental health and whatnot. And then there's also a yearly requirement to maintain your CIT certification. Um, here in Provo, a goal that we have is for all of our officers to be certified. So Provo sends all of our new officers to this training. I've been through it. It's been a couple of years now. And then um, we're also in the process of getting all of our older officers certified. And that's obviously class dependent because the program itself has officers from all over that come in and participate in that course. But it's also a separate training in addition to what we have to do as a manual or uh, I mean, a uh, mandatory training from the state. So as law enforcement, we respond to all sorts of calls. Um, a lot of those calls will involve the special needs community. Just as like certain issues arise, um, they might be law enforcement related, they might not, but a lot of people rely on us to kind of help with any sort of issues that they may have at that point. So one of the things I wanted to go over real quick is when should you call and what numbers you should call? Um, so for emergencies, when you feel anyone's safety is at risk or when a loved one has eloped and you can't find them, um, call 911, right? That's going to get you your quick, immediate response. We understand that it's an emergency going that way. Um, for non-emergencies, 
could be like an individual in crisis where safety isn't a concern, civil or custodial issues, juvenile problems, or thing, incidents that have previously happened or not currently happening. We just ask that you call our non-emergency line. And the reason for that is just to help free up 911. That way we don't have a bunch of people calling 911 and someone that might have an emergency you just can't get through. Um, but anytime that you feel like you need police assistance, um, feel free to call us because we'd much rather respond out and find out like, hey, we're not needed and just and be like, oh, this is what happened sort of thing, rather than find out that we needed to be there and weren't called until later. And now we have a bigger issue to deal with. So how our response is determined depends on the type of call. So dispatch will receive a call and our call takers will start typing in notes into a program that uh, labels the call and sends it out to the officer's computers. And how dispatch will label that is kind of determines what the type of call it is, whether it be like a disorderly, a runaway, a noise complaint, a traffic accident, things like that. Um, our dispatchers are then made aware of this call and then they, uh, they dispatch officers from patrol as they're available. So higher priority calls will come in first and we'll try and prioritize sending officers to that. And if it's a non-emergency or something that's delayed, officers might take a little bit to get there. But like I said, things such as like runaways and um, individuals with special needs especially tend to take high priority. So you'll get a patrol officer response relatively quickly. Um, and then depending on what type of call it is may result in multiple officers going to that call. So if we get a call of like a runaway or someone that's um, in crisis, we might send multiple officers just from a safety perspective for both the community safety as well as for ours because then we have multiple officers there to help kind of organize and keep people crowd and calm everything down. Um, elopement is a big one. It's probably one of the biggest calls that we get regarding individuals with special needs. Um, it happens, we happen to have it a lot, especially with individuals that are, that have autism. Um, and in these cases, we'll have multiple officers that respond to the area immediately. And what will happen is that the officer that's in charge of that call is called our primary officer. They'll respond to and meet with the parents and they will check the home. Even if the parents have already checked the home, that's just a procedure that we have on our end or the immediate lo location. Cause we can't tell you how many times we've gone to a call where a kid's run away or missing and we find them like hiding in the toy box or under the bed. Um, but what we want parents to know is that even though the officer is responding to their home to check their home and whatnot, there are other officers that are already in the area and going to be looking for um, the runaway child. Um, and the reason for that is that we need enough, we need officers to fill out what's called an NCIC paperwork. What this does is that this allows us to label the individual as missing and it broadcasts it out to all other agencies. So especially here in like the Wasatch Front area, we have like front runner and buses and things like that. And our cities run together where it's very easy for a child with special needs who might get turned around and get lost to wander into another jurisdiction. Um, and what the NCIC paperwork allows us to do is to share that information across all of the law enforcement throughout the, the nation, basically. So if we have an individual with autism that um, elopes and gets on a bus and ends up going up to Ogden, if an, if an officer finds them, they're going to be able to see their description, figure out what their name is, figure out where they came from and all of that. And that's why that paperwork's so necessary. And the reason I, I hone in on that, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason I hone in on that is that we found a lot of parents don't quite understand why we're stopping and taking the time to look, to fill out this paperwork rather than immediately going out and, and searching for um, the child. And again, it's not that we're not looking for the child. We'll have other officers doing that, but it's critical that we fill out that NCIC paperwork. That way if instead of the child being in Provo anymore and they're in Orem, we are able to mobilize more law enforcement assets to be able to find them. It's also not uncommon that we'll also call out the fire department and other agencies to assist us in looking. So another call that we'll get is aggressive behaviors. Obviously this often gets listed as domestic violence by mistake from our dispatchers as they're taking in initial incidents. Um, also can be called family problems or juvenile problems. You'll have multiple officers that will will respond. And again, this is for safety and a standard practice on our end. Um, we'll have officers that will arrive and will speak with multiple people. 
and figure out what's going on. And there are rare situations where an individual with special needs might need to be restrained, right? We don't, we're not there to hurt anyone. We're not there to do anything like that. But if there's a safety issue there, we might need to just temporarily restrain an individual with special needs while we resolve the, the situation and figure out how to calm them down. And again, we're not trying to do it to be rude. We're not going to be mean about it. We're not going to go overboard with it, but we just want to ensure that the safety of everyone involved, including that individual with special needs is taken care of. So if they're hurting themselves and it's a safety issue or at risk of hurting someone else, they may maybe restrain and that can be in different ways, right? An officer might just hold onto their arm for a little bit. We might set them in the back of the car and kind of let them breathe. We have, it. it's kind of case dependent. Um, one of the biggest things that we'll do is that we'll try and find a way to resolve the situation. As police officers, we find that we're a lot of times problem solvers. And so someone will call us with a problem and not necessarily the problem is that someone needs to go to jail, but that it's a different problem that we can also help solve. And so ways that we do that is that we talk to like caretakers, family members, individuals involved, as well as the individual with special needs, if, if we can communicate with them effectively and try and figure out what the best situation is. Um, sometimes we can take them to the ER or Vantage Point or Wasatch Receiving Center to talk to someone and get um, immediate help with like a therapist or a caseworker if it's necessary or um, if the caretaker or parent would like us to do so. One of the biggest things that we find though is that the parents are going to be the biggest asset that we have in helping us understand um, how to help the situation. So I went to a call once where it was, a juvenile with autism was about 10 and he was kind of being aggressive, but wasn't super like being physically aggressive, just verbally aggressive and being standoffish with his, with his mom. I was able to go and we were able to talk to the mom, figure out what the kid liked. And just in figuring out what the kid liked and having a different person there, I was able to talk to him about like video games and my police car and let him sit in my police car and just doing that resolve the situation without any need for any sort of actual law enforcement intervention, just having a third party there to talk to someone about something that they like can really be a hook and help bring down those sort of behaviors. Officer Hutchinson, um, I would yeah. think the slides might be stuck on the title. Oh. Well, let me see if I can fix that. Great. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that to our attention in the chat. Let me. Can you guys see my Zoom screen? Yes. All right. Does it look like it's pulled up? It is pulled up. Yeah, we're on the title right. slide there. Do you Let want me to flip through? Pull up the wrong PowerPoint, but all right. Great. Looks good. Thank you. Is there anybody that wants me to go back and kind of go over, just breeze through those? Most of it is just the talking points with the pictures. Or would you guys just rather I continue from where we're at? I think I, we can continue where we're at, but thank you for adjusting the slides for us. Yep. All right. Let me get to where we're back where we're at. All right. Everyone can, everyone's on the slide that says aggressive behaviors. Yes. Thank you. All right. So we just finished talking about that. All right. Um, Another issue that we come across a lot with individuals with special needs is going to be noise complaints. Um, types of noises that are being reported a lot of times is like stimming, loud music or TV or yelling and screaming. Officers will typically arrive on scene and speak to someone in the home and just ensure the safety of everyone there and make sure there's no actual incident that needs to be taken care of, right? Because if it's a neighbor calling, we might not actually know what the yelling and screaming is. Um, We'll typically, we'll try and find a resolution or ask them to keep it down, but we're also going to be super understanding of the situation. I had a number of calls a few years ago where an individual was living with special needs, was living in an apartment with his mother. And it was like every Tuesday when he had to do homework shortly after the school year started, because it was a change of routine, he would start yelling and screaming and stomping around. And all the neighbors in the, the apartment complex were always calling and saying like, I hear people fighting or I hear this. Um, 
but once we were able to narrow that down and figure out, oh, this is what's happening every time, well, normally we were able to just send out one officer each time and be like, hey, just want to make sure everyone's okay. All right. Is there anything we can do to help? Yes or no? And then kind of go from there. So we're, we're very understanding of, of situations involving individuals with special needs, right? We understand that an individual with special needs isn't always going to be able to like withhold some of the noises that they have, whether it be like a loud TV or stimming, um, pacing, things of that nature. So we're super understanding of that and we'll work with you to ensure that there isn't actually any issue and that will kind of leave you be if you'd like us to at that point. Um, a found person is another type of call that we get, whether um, it depends on the, how the individual was found um, and is called in, but it's typically labeled for us as a found person. This can be like a kid that's wandered off in the middle of the night, things of that nature. Um, we'll find that we'll typically arrive and try and speak with the individual and figure out if they're verbal or nonverbal. Um, if they're verbal, we'll check their names, file and addresses and try and contact parents or care workers or someone to assist them if possible. We'll also check our NCIC and ATL alerts, which is the paperwork I was talking about earlier to figure out if they have been labeled missing or as a runaway or have eloped, something of that nature. Um, if the individual requires full-time support or they're a juvenile, we, we won't release them until um, they are released to a responsible party, like a family member or guardian. And that's just our policy. If they're an adult and they're able to adequately like care for themselves, they live on their own, that sort of thing, then we'll then we'll just make sure that they're okay and let them go at that point. But as far as people that require full-time care and juveniles, we have to release them to a family or guardian member. Um, so here's a big thing is, how can you help law enforcement when you call? So when you call us and are asking us to come and assist you, there are certain things that, we, that you can do that will also help us help you. Um, so specifically with like elopement calls, we find that if you have a description ready, it helps us a lot, such as hair, eye color, height, um, clothing description, and recent photos. This is a big one. Um, some parents like to write down on a whiteboard what their kid was wearing that day. So that if they elope or get lost at an event or something like that, they have a quick reference to be able to give us a clothing description because clothing descriptions are huge. If you're at the 4th of July parade and you report like a 10 year old that's five foot with brown hair and brown eyes, it could be, there could be like a hundred 10 year olds that match the description going forward. But if you have that description, plus like a clothing description, they're wearing like a Fortnite shirt and camo shorts, things of that nature. Um, it helps us a lot as well as with recent photos. If you take like a photo that day or have like a recent school photo, so we know what the individual looks like, we can actually send that out to everybody that's looking for your child. That way they also know, um, what your child looks like and can more easily identify them that way. And then obviously be ready to fill out the NCIC form, um, with the officer as thoroughly and as quickly as we can. So that we can get more resources and make sure all law enforcement across the nation is aware of of the, the missing child at that point. I say child, but it could also be a missing an adult or someone of that nature as well. <clears throat> um, also, if you have any sort of like GPS or trackers, just have those ready. Um, I know that some individ, uh, parents and caretakers will like to have like little pockets where they'll tuck in an air tag or someone if they know that their loved ones don't know to elope. So just be ready to have that to share with us, as well as if they have a phone, what their phone number is and carrier, because then we can actually try and ping the phone. It's not always accurate, but it can help us get a general area of where they might be at, if especially if they have been missing for a while. Um, also have a list of places that they uh, frequent or places they like to go, any places they've been found before. Do they have like an affinity for water, traffic, known friends' houses in the area that we might be able to check? what their method of travel was. Do they have their bike? Do they have their scooter? Do they know how to ride the bus? Are they going to ride the bus? Um, and then also just how they will respond to law enforcement. Um, will they answer their name? Are they scared of law enforcement? Will they run away when they see us or when we call out to them, fearing that they're scared? Do they have any sensitivity to lights and sirens? Because we'll try and adjust our approach from that sort of tactic if we need to. We can turn down bright headlights, things like that, get out on foot more if they're more afraid of like lights and police cars 
in order to help facilitate the search for this individual. For aggressive and ungovernable behavior, things that can help us is descriptions of triggers, topics not to talk about, um, and things not to do that will just upset them more. Because what we don't want to do is that we don't want to show up on a situation where someone's asking for us to help and we just make it worse. Um, instead, have a, have a list of, also let us know and have a list of things to talk about that might calm them down, things that they like to do, things they like to talk about. I shared the example earlier of like the kid that I talked about video games and like he liked police cars. So I let him sit in my police car and I talked to him about it. Just having those list of things can very quickly help us um, more resolve the situation and, and be able to assist you better. As well as if you have ways that the problem has been resolved in the past. Um, things that we might not think of right off the bat. Like if you're a uh, kid loves sodas or suckers and we're able to, and you allow us to give them a sucker, things like that that can help um, lower and resolve that situation can go a long way for us to more quickly help you and prevent any sort of further situations. Other law enforcement interactions. I like to throw this in as kind of like a catch-all. But basically, just be ready to explain the situation to the law enforcement officer. Be ready to ask, answer questions. A lot of times, parents will get frustrated because it feels like the officer isn't quite understanding. Um, but we might not necessarily know your loved one in particular or how they how they are on a day-to-day -day basis or might not quite understand or we just got off of another call that's similar, so we want to make sure how we understand it's different. Um, and so we might have a lot of questions and we might repeat things back to you and paraphrase what you're telling us. So that way we know that we're understanding the situation fully, right? Also, don't be afraid to break down what assistance you're needing from the officer. Well, I'll ask a lot of times when I go to calls, even if it's not related to special needs, like, okay, what are you looking for from us to help you do? Just because then we have a clear goal and we have a clear understanding of what way to go about this. And we get uh, other calls all the time where we might where it might come in as something and it turns out it's an individual special needs. Um, my brother-in-law has autism. And so when he comes and visits us, it's not uncommon for us to realize, oh, he accidentally took a soda from the store we just walked out of and I have to go back in and explain and pay for the soda. Um, just be ready to explain situations like that to the law enforcement officer. They're, we're gonna be understanding of that, right? If your individual with special needs like takes a candy bar, um, not understanding that that's stealing because it hasn't been paid for yet, we're going to be understanding with that. We might ask that you pay for the candy bar, but we'll be understanding and we're not going to be taking like action going forward in that sense. Another huge thing that we find helps a lot is participating in our community events. Most police agencies around here will have community events. Most of us will participate in national night out here in Provo. We have what's called brats with cops where we, for three or four days out of in the summer, we'll like cook hot dogs and just hang out with people in the community, whoever wants to come by. Um, coffee with the cops, another good one, shop with a cop, just those community events that allows your loved one with special needs to get more interaction with law enforcement. So that way they aren't afraid of us. And, um, so that way, if we do get called going forward, um, they're not, they're not afraid of us. They understand who we are and what we do. Um, don't be afraid to say hello as well. Like if you see us during BYU games, if we're out eating lunch, um, working traffic during runs, parades, anything like that. If we're not on like an immediate call, by all means, be like, hey, can my son come up and say hello? Or can my loved one come up and say hello? Um, it goes a long way for just community outreach going both ways. Um, for more uh, information on those and when we do those, feel free to follow us on social media. Um, we're pretty good about posting when we're gonna do community events and what we'll be in, things of that nature. Another thing I wanted to talk about is our special needs registry. A lot of agencies will have a special needs registry. Here in Provo, we have one. I'm working on kind of revamping it. But one of the things that it does is that it creates a file for us with the information that's provided by the individual that fills it out. So if you go in and fill out this special needs registry for your loved one, um, we can then use that information that you provided us to help us in, in calls that we might go to, right? This information can be used to locate an individual's address, phone number, and emergency contact if we locate the individual and need to get a hold of someone. It can also be, um, this 
file can be sent to officers' computers who are responding to calls if you call for help or are who are helping look for an individual that's missing. And so these special needs registries are a huge resource for us because it can provide all sorts of information very quickly because we already have it on file. We're not having to ask for it over and over again and hope that everyone asks the right questions or remembers the right information to, to give, um, especially in a, in a moment where you have to call the police. A lot of times it's not everyone's best day. Like maybe you're panicking because your loved one's gone missing for a minute. Um, and so you're kind of panicking. You might forget that, oh, I took a recent photo or things of that nature. So things that we look for within our special needs registry, it'll have, it's like a whole form that you go fill out and they'll have like your name, you fill out your information, you fill out the address. Um, but it'll have the names of the, of your loved ones. It'll ask to, you to attach a recent photo, which I tend to try and ask people to kind of keep up with on their, with their, like the recent school photos, because most kids anyway, get school photos or to pick a, like an event that happens every year. Cause then you have you know that there's a recent photo. So if you go on vacation with your loved one and you know, you're going to be taking a photo at your yearly vacation down to Moab, at least you have a photo of a recent photo within the year of that individual. Um, you're in these special needs registry. It's also, you can also add the things that we've talked about, such as triggers and places that they frequent frequented. So special needs registry is located right on our website. So if you go to just provopolice.org, uh, org or provo.org and pull up the police department. You'll find our webpage and right down here in the corner, like as you scroll down right below the picture that says Provo Police, you'll see the special needs registry. Um, you'll come to this page and it kind of tells you a little bit about it if you're still unsure what it's used for, or why it's used. It gives you a little bit of information there. And then you can click get started if you want to fill it out. Um, like I said, the first page, you're going to fill out your information. So here I have like Yogi Bear is filling this out because their loved one, Boo Boo Bear, has special needs and they want to make us aware of that. So you fill out like your address, your contact information and whatnot. Um, and then you fill out their their address where they live, as well as a recent photo. So here's Boo Boo Bear. Um, and then you'd go through and fill out their information. So you have Boo Boo Bear. Um, he lives at 445 West Center Street. And then you have like all this information. So you have like employer name, school, school name, if applicable, things like that, how high, how tall they are, um, what their hair color is, their eye color, if they wear glasses, things of that nature. And like I said, this is a real big thing for us because it helps us with these calls and finding and finding resolutions to these sort of interactions that we might have with the special needs community quicker, as well as it alerts us that the individual has special needs. Um, because in their names file, we can list like, hey, they have special needs. They might ha not fully comprehend what you're saying. They might not be able to talk, things of that nature. We've been able to use this to um, help assist with kids that have eloped in the middle of the night, right? And the parents don't know that they've gone yet. And we're able to like type in a description to our system and pull up the files of the description that matches and find the photo and be like, oh, this is who this is. This is where they live. Let's go get them home before the parents even wake up and realize that their child has been missing or their loved one has been missing. Um, if you do fill out the special needs registry, you can always call and, up and update your information and photos with us. Like I said, I typically recommend updating um, information and photos when you get new school photos or when you go on like your yearly trip or something like that, where you have a reoccurring photo that has that new photo. And then you, that's kind of your reminder to be like, Oh, I need to update a new phone number or we moved and I need to get this new photo because they've grown up a lot or they now have facial hair and they didn't before or they dyed their hair or they lost their hair. And then we have more updated photos and more updated information. Um, the state of Utah also has a special needs registry. This one's specifically for large scale emergencies. This one isn't, doesn't go necessarily straight to police officers that are responding to calls, but this is in the event of like an earthquake or a major disaster. That way the state of Utah has a list of like, okay, these are the homes that might need additional resources to help them. Right. Um, and then the state can mobilize what they need to do. So like if there's an evacuation for a wildfire or something, they can understand, oh, this person isn't very mobile. We can send resources out to go assist them. So if you want to fill that one out as well, I, I'd recommend it if you feel like it's needed. Um, the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is 
uh, alerts.utahcounty.gov. This is what we call our reverse 911 system. I, I promote this within this training because it's useful for us from a law enforcement perspective. This basically will send an alert to your phone if something's happening within like your city or Utah County, something of that nature. And you can sign up for what kind of alerts you get. But where we come in with the use of this for special needs is that if a whole bunch of people are signed up for this, we've actually used it before when like a child is missing or a loved one's missing, we can send out a reverse 911 for a large area. So like if they were last seen in Provo within the last like hour, we can send it out through Springville, Provo and Orem. And we've done this before where everyone that's signed up for this gets an emergency alert. That's like, Hey, be on the lookout for this individual. They're 13 years old. This is what they're last seen wearing. If found, please contact the police department so we can get them home. And we've been able to use that pretty effectively. So that's the reason that I, I promote Utah County or alerts.utahcounty.gov within this training. Um, a lot of people don't know about it, but it's, it's also a great resource. So I like to promote that and have other people promote that because then it just assists us even further with what we need to do, as well as if there's an emergency alert, you're made aware of that. And then this just kind of walks through how to go through it. This one's pretty easy. So it's just what city or town are you in? Um, what location are you in? What's your address? Verify this address and it'll pull up and show a picture and then you verify where you're at and you can sign up for what alerts you have. And so this is Hutchinson, the, we have a question in the chat. Um, yeah. How do they update the current registry? Do they call or go in or go online? What's the best way to do that? For the special needs registry, as far as Provo, I'm working on getting it set up to where you can do it online. Right now, the best way is to probably call in and either ask for, and then ask for our community resource um, department. I actually have, I think, a photo of the phone number. Maybe, maybe it's on the end. Um, but if you call in and ask just our general line and ask to speak with our community-oriented policing team, they'll send you through to um, our secretary who will take down a note and then one of us will call you back is probably the best way to do it at that point. As far as for alerts.utahcounty.gov and the uh, statewide special needs registry, I think you could just do it online. Um, and like I said, I'm working on getting it to where we can update your, that way you can update your information online with our special needs as well, a special needs registry as well. But we're not quite there yet. We're still working with the company that does our online reporting system that does this for us um, to kind of get that set up. But that's the best way is to probably just call us if you call a non-emergency line and ask to speak with the secretary at Community Oriented Policing. So also going forward, we're going to have um, business cards and flyers that we'll be able to hand out and share with our community partners that will have like the phone number on there and a QR code that you can scan to use a special needs registry. Does that answer the question? Um, yeah. And then I want to take some time. That's the end of the presentation, but I want to take some time to kind of hear from you guys on like what training ideas you have. If you have recommendations for training topics to cover or recommendation for like response to calls, interaction or shares of interactions you've liked, what could be done differently? Um, just things of that nature. And if you have general questions, so up here in the corner, there is the QR code for the special needs registry. If you'd like to scan that, feel free. I'll leave that up for just a second while we get moving over to questions and I'm free to take as many questions as you guys have. So we have one question in the chat. We have a couple in the chat. The first one is, are these resources available with other police departments too? Um, this parent lives in Roy and was wondering if the Roy police department has the same special needs registry and other resources you mentioned. So I'm not hundred percent sure on Roy specifically. I know a lot of departments will, um, one, one thing you can do is reach out to your department and find out or check their website. And if they don't, you could always ask them if they keep files, like names files or local files is what we typically call them, and ask if you can provide updated information on a names or local file for that individual. So that they, even if they don't have a special needs registry, they can have the same information already lined up. Because most departments will use a software that keeps like information for people's names, like addresses, things of that nature that 
you might be able to just call and update with them. Okay, thank you. Our next question in the I'm chat is, is the Utah County Alerts the one that's connected to the yellow sticker for the car? Oh, wait, sorry. We answered that question. Is that right? Crystal, did we answer your question? Feel free to unmute if I messed that up. Sorry. No, my first question was answered. Um, I was just wondering if it was the one that was connected to the yellow circle for the vehicle. That one wasn't answered yet. I'm not sure what yellow circle you're referring to. Can you fill me in a little bit more? Yeah, so two years ago when I moved to Utah County, we went to an Orem Police Department um, autism awareness uh, lunch, and they had us fill out paperwork about our child, sim similar to what you're stating the Provo Police Department is, mm -hmm. um, the registry. Yep. And we put in our picture of my kiddo and they gave us a yellow sticker to put on our windshield. And anytime oh. that they see the sticker, they would they would realize, okay, I need to scan that with our phone and our information pops up in case we get into an accident. Yeah, so that's not um, the alerts.utahcounty.gov. That sounds like it's an Orem thing. Okay. The nice, the nice thing about that though, is that most police departments will use a, a software called Spillman. And so any local file that's populated within Utah County using Spillman, everyone else in Utah County can see. So I know Orem does it. So I, I bet that the information you filled out is similar to our registry where we then use that population to update a names file within Spillman. And then that information can be shared with all law enforcement throughout Utah County that uses Spillman. Okay. So even if um, the yellow sticker isn't the same, if we, if you call us in Provo, cause you're down at like the mall or the movie theater and you give us your name, we can find your names files and be able to find and get your information that way because it's already been populated through Orem, which is a nice thing that we have. <laughs> so. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Can you explain what the NCIC form is about again? Yeah, absolutely. So NCIC stands for National Information Criminal Information Database. It's a national database held by the, the FBI. It is basically a large database where we list a whole bunch of stuff, right? For purposes of this, it's where we list people that are run, that are like juveniles that are run away, missing persons, missing persons that are endangered, things of that nature. And the NCIC database will be pulled up anytime any officer runs that information. So if we have our, if we have Boo Boo Bear, our special needs individual that, um, that I was talking about earlier, right? As an example, I use that example because that's what we use in our training a lot of times is Yogi Bear. Um, so an officer will fill out that paperwork and then our dispatch will insert that paperwork into that database. So if someone finds Boo Boo Bear, like anywhere in the nation, whether they somehow managed to sneak on a boat and get go to Alaska or down to Texas and they're missing from here in Provo, if they run their name or information, they will pull up that NCIC paperwork that says, oh, this person is missing out of here. Um, there's actually an example a year or so ago where there was a 19-year-old that went missing with, with autism that went missing out of California and had been missing for several years. And officers in Utah were able to locate that individual, run his name and automatically get an NCIC paperwork back. And it's called an NCIC hit. And so it alerts us like, hey, there's information in NCIC about this individual. And it tells us, oh, this person's been missing. So that's kind of how it works. It's like a big server for law enforcement where we can list a bunch of things, including individuals that are missing. Does that sort of answer the question? It's kind of a complex thing, but. I had a question. Um, I have a four-year-old with Down syndrome, and then we also have a nine-year-old with autism. She's pretty mm -hmm. high-functioning, but um, has still wandered away. Right now, my biggest issue is that our four-year-old little guy with Down syndrome, he's pretty much nonverbal, 
Um, but keeps he keeps getting out and running away. Yep. And we so we're in Vineyard. We're covered, by, I think, by like Utah, Utah County Sheriff's yeah. Department. Um, I'm trying to fix like I've been all over the Internet trying to find some kind of like alarm system or tracking device or something. Um, we have like locks on everything, but he's learning to climb our fence now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I mean, short of like tying him in the house, I, it's probably only going to be a few more months before he's able to get all the way over our back fence. Okay. Are there any kind of like alarm system, like perimeter, because I've, I've looked into several that, um, like we had angel sense, we've had a few of them our house has a road on three sides of it and our back road is main street and they can't get the perimeter like exact enough so that it's not also covering one of the streets in it or it's so small that it's alarming when he's in certain parts of the backyard or our house um it looked like the only one that i could find that had like that exact like perimeter monitoring was through like had to be set up through a police department and mm -hmm. the police department kind of had to like buy into the program and if he got out I would have to call the police department and have somebody mm -hmm. there locate him Do okay you, I don't know if that makes sense what my question um, is but just any so, suggestions so um a lot of times with this Again, I think one of the best bets that you're going to have, right, is to make sure that you have his information on file with Utah County. They'll have a, a local file with Spillman. Um, and you can do okay. that. Too. And you're in Vineyard, so you're pretty close. Yeah, to one. they have a big poster of him with his info down at just like the Vineyard station area. But yeah, I would maybe just either talk to one of the Utah County individuals, or if you wanted to, you could also fill out um, to see if like Orem or someone can, if you can fill out their special needs registry and kind of work with them. Or even okay. if you get um, my email, I'm more than happy to check into that with you that we can have your okay. information in, in Spillman. Um, as far as like the elopement thing, I've seen some pretty creative stuff that isn't necessarily always like something that's designed for it, if that makes sense. Sure. So I've seen... I've seen people that have set up the motion ring doorbell cameras to where it like only captures where like along the fence line barely. So that way if like mm -hmm. you have motion along the fence line, it alerts your phone and you can check the thing and be like, Oh, it's a bird or, Oh, my four-year-old's climbing the fence again. Yeah. Um, as I, as like that quick sort of alert, I've seen people do okay. air tags with like the, um, I'm not super iPhone friendly, but I guess like you could put a certain area yeah. if out of a certain area to alert. Yeah. I've seen that. I've seen people use the temporary airbrush tattoos for their nonverbal children. Okay. Um, where like it sticks for like a week or so. And like, it just has yeah. like, my name is this, this is a phone number sort of thing. So that if they're located, it's like, Oh, it's right here on the arm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a hard topic to con to, to really nail down. Right. And that's the reason that we get so many calls that we do regarding elopement. Like I said, yeah. it's probably the primary call that we get involving individuals with special needs. Um, so yeah, I'd make sure that you're, you're, you have updated information within your fi local file. Um, I believe we can probably get you my, I can either write down my email in a word document so that you guys have it or any or you guys can get it through united angels if you if you need but i, I can i'm more than happy to help you with that even though you live in vineyard right okay because this yeah the city all connects anyway and i'm sure that <laughs> i'm sure um, that it would we're all in provo a lot because yeah. grandma and grandpa are there so well perfect you can also just fill out our special needs registry and go about it that way <laughs> would okay. probably be a good way to do that too so it might not Thank say you. if you fill out, yeah, if you fill out our special needs registry, um, it might require a Provo address. You can just use your parents' address or you can okay. use 
the department address for anybody else that might be looking to do this, maybe use the department address. Cause then like records will populate that information and then they'll send me the, the file. And then I verify all that stuff. So I'd be calling you anyway and being like, Hey, just want to make sure that like, this is correct. This is correct. And any additional information. So. Okay. That's probably your easiest way of going about it. I have just awesome. thank your email address, Officer Hutchinson's email address in the chat right now for anyone that would like to grab that from the chat. And um, that made me think of a question. If we have children that are frequently staying with grandma and grandpa, or they go to school in a different city, should we be registering our children in those other cities as well, where they are very frequent, um, frequently in? You can. Um, I would, so most, most registries are just going to be put into Spillman. So what I would recommend is figuring out if they share the same local information, because if you register, if you put your child in the special needs registry in Provo, but you frequent Lehigh, right? Lehigh and Provo share the same Spillman system. So the information that I input here is visible to them there, which I think almost everyone runs Spillman with the exception of Highway Patrol. So you'd probably be covered there. So I think as long as you know that you've registered your child in one of those locations, you'll probably have it there. Um, I would just make sure that when you use that registry, maybe have them add in the notes because we have an area where we can add a ton of comments and descriptions and stuff like that. Be like, hey, they often frequent this address in Lehigh, it's grandparents' address, or they go to school in Orem and it's this school. And so we can we can work with with people that way. Thank you. There's a comment here in the chat. My son's first interaction with police was when we were witnesses to a serious car accident. It could have been a very traumatic experience, but the police engaged my little guy in conversation and gave him a stuffed animal, which helped him calm down and divert his attention away from the accident. It was such a good intro to begin teaching him that police are helpers and people that we can trust. The little stuffed animal was a very powerful tool. Yeah, and I, I see that a lot. Um, a lot of officers will carry a stuffed animal for individuals with special needs or young children. Um, yeah, it, it, I'm glad to hear it. That's an awesome interaction, right? Anytime that we can have those positive interactions is always, it's not only a benefit to, to your family and your um, special needs and loved one, but it's also helpful for us, right? Because as law enforcement we never get called on someone's favorite day, right? So our days tend to be long and drug out and we're always going like emergency to emergency. So sometimes getting to have those good in interactions is almost, if not more beneficial to us, just being able to have a good interaction with someone where it's not like someone's mad at us or someone's for not doing something or for arresting someone or we're not running emergency to emergency or even if we're in the middle of something, just having a good interaction it helps us immensely as well. So we're always glad when something like that happens. Sylvia, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Can you describe what would happen if say an over 18 year old um, is at home and is become agitated and hitting and just can't be calmed down with other things, <laughs> distractions that you uh, have mentioned, and they need to be taken out of the home for just a period of time. Can you tell me what would happen to that 18 plus year old? Yeah, so yes. it's going to be case dependent, right? Um, very much we try and refrain from taking that person to jail with everything we have, right? Um, a lot of times we will lean heavily into our community resources here that I have great knowledge of and know, know a lot about. Um, we have here in Provo, just because just that's what I'm familiar with, we have the Wasatch Receiving Center where they have therapists and chaos workers in an area where people can just go and be away for a while if they're over 18 and they can have someone there for up to 24 hours and they can sleep on a couch. They can talk to someone, just kind of have time away from home. We'll also, we can also do what's called a pink sheet, which it's very case dependent, right? Because it, a pink sheet, we're basically forcing someone to go to the hospital to talk to a crisis worker. Um, and it's the same. And so basically that individual has to be a danger to themselves or others an immediate danger to themselves or others. So it's not always an option. 
but with that, we can force someone to go to the emergency room. Well, where they'll have to stay there and talk to a therapist and a caseworker and a representative from Wasatch Mental Health to get assistance that way. And so then, and we use that because if they are a danger to themselves or others, it's an alternative to jail in which we d- we know that they're probably not going to get the resources that they necessarily need right off the bat, right? But they can go there and immediately speak to a therapist and a caseworker. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's always not going to be trouble, right? Like a lot of times we'll refer these sort of cases over to mental health court, which is a court here in at our Provo City Justice Court that deals specifically in mental health, right? So they're not going to go there and throw the book at someone. They're going to understand and be like, hey, as part of your punishment for this, we require you to do treatment or we require you to visit with your therapist, right? And they're very good about working the mental health aspect to help mitigate this sort of criminal aspect that might also come along with it, right? And it's an alternative to regular court and the regular criminal justice system. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. If there are any other questions, you can feel free to unmute your microphone and um, and speak, or you can also go in the chat. We'll give everyone just another moment here. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, I did include your email address in there. Um, and we will we'll, we'll finish up the recording and then send that link out. Um, and I can send it out to everyone that's RSVP. So if you have someone that wanted to come or you want to share it with your spouse um, or, or partner or whoever, um, then you can do that. Officer Hutchison, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you taking the time to put this together and share with us how we can work with law enforcement to help support our families and to keep everybody safe. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me and taking the time and it helps us help serve the community better. So, and anyone can feel free to reach out to me via email with any questions or issues you might have. So. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the parents that joined us today. We hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.